Hi, right, everybody. We're going to start now, guys. Uh, we have the online audience as well as the audience here. So we're online and we're about to start. So I'm going to start by introducing Dr. Costa. Um, you can see his title on the, the first slide. And of course, it's a, it's a very special honor to have him. Um, I say that sincerely because I, I think Dr. Costa is really in a great position to, to teach all of us. I'll tell you briefly about his history. Um, interestingly, I, I only learned recently that your early training was in Providence, Rhode Island. I happen to grow up in Rhode Island. Um, and then he also uh, got a master's at Rutgers and then a P, uh, actually a science D at Harvard, in the uh, same place that Dr. Brower got his science D. Um, then, he, then he continued on his trajectory and it was interesting to note, <laughs> when you think about the, the regulations in the United States in particular on ozone, for example, uh, it's a great story, I'm sure I'll tell you about it, but these come from careful years of research in which he participated in. So you see a real connection between the work and the policy, um, and this is a living example of it. Um, and most recently, he's become the National Program Director at the EPA, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, for the Air, Climate, and Energy uh, Research Program. Um, and so I wanted to welcome you and thank you for making the trip. Um, we look forward to hearing your talk. Okay, well. Thank you very much, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks also to Mike, and it was a pleasure meeting Ben. I certainly have heard of you, but hadn't met you before. Um, I guess I was told in preparing for this lecture today to think of the audience as being a fairly general but sophisticated audience. So that's a compliment to you all, uh, as well as the online audience. Uh, so what, I, what I've done is I've tried to mix things uh, both to show the evolution of the science and policy, to address some of the specific science, but not really specific science, uh, tie in how policy interweaves uh, a little bit, not a little bit, but perhaps a lot with politics. Uh, and as I move to the end uh, of sort of the, what we know, and we start to think about where we're going, uh, I've taken the liberty to kind of editorialize, give my own personal perspective where I think the real, uh, real environmental science perhaps could go, should go over the next couple decades, which would be your generation. Uh, and we look forward to your success. Uh, and uh, uh, with, the, with the concept of climate, energy use, and all those sorts of things. So uh, with that, um, I tried to be cute in the title, since obviously whenever people think of air pollution, they think of smokestacks. Uh, so, but in fact, it was an accumulation. Things have stacked up over time to, to uh, uh, bring us the uh, uh, the science and, and the administrative and the administration of of public health policy as we know it. Uh, so, I've tried to outline uh, what we're going to be talking about. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the human uh, story, the, the rise of public discontent. Uh, this is very much, you know, the whole area of environmental science, environmental health, is one that's been driven by public perspective. And with that public perspective was the, the evolution of the law. This, this would be largely US-centric, but it has some implications, I think, that cross, crosses borders. Uh, the 1970 Clean Air Act Amendment, which most people refer to as the Clean Air Act in the US, it was actually an amendment to an existing law. Um, and in uh, how that law actually was can be considered the game-changing law uh, of environmental health. Uh, and the fact that human health and animal toxicology and epidemiology have all played very significant roles in the evolution of the science uh, and how uh, it's taken us to where we are and where we're going to go. And then the Clean Air Act, interestingly enough, in, in some ways it's almost like the Constitution in some ways, that it can be interpreted over time and has been used with the greenhouse gas uh, decision in the, in the United States. Uh, and in fact, it, it is a flexible uh, piece of legislation that really makes a big difference in the United States in, in moving this forward. Uh, and lastly, as I said, I will talk about sort of my perspective as to where things could go in the future. I'd be happy to discuss these a little bit with, with folks. Well, the issue of smoke uh, has been around for a long time. There is evidence of emphysema in mummified organs uh, particularly the, the lung of, of some uh, mummies that they've actually extricated. But in more modern times, in the context of sort of uh, 
the uh, uh, socio-political environment we live in, King Edward I actually banned the use of sea coal uh, in London under penalty of death. And, and in, in preparing for this over a long time ago, I actually dug around a lot. And actually, there's, there's one case where that was, in fact, uh, uh, implemented. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it was. But King Edward, like many of the kings, you know, they stay in London until it gets too bad. Then they go out to you know, the, uh, the cleaner environment in, the, uh, in Scotland, perhaps, where they can uh, uh, enjoy the cleaner air. John Everland, who uh, wrote about air pollution in the 17th century, um, talked about London's inhabitants breathe nothing but an impure and thick mist accompanied, by, accompanied with a fuliginous and filthy vapor. Uh, we don't exactly describe it that way now, but uh, I suppose that's an interesting way of putting it. And almost in Shakespearean tones, he said, talks about the corruption of the lungs and the disordering of the entire habit of their bodies. You know, we've often thought of, or we've almost always thought of air pollution as a pulmonary issue, a lung issue. Well, in fact, everyone here is predicting much of what we're talking about now, cardiovascular, reproductive, neurologic, and all these other things. So it has implications that go well beyond the lungs. But not everything about air pollution has been bad over time. It's had some positive cultural influences. Uh, if you look um, in the literature, in, in Dickens, he talked about, again, using language which we don't oftentimes use now, black vomit, referring to uh, air pollution. Uh, blasting all things living in inanimate, because in fact, if you look at many of the buildings that are actually affected by the acidified air pollution and uh, cause uh, corruption and uh, dissolution of some of the limestone. Um, so it, it's been a tool that's been used by people in, in literature. And in fact, Monet used to come over from France to get nice sunsets because of the distortion of colors. So he would paint like the Tower of London. So, you know, uh, like most things, there are two sides to every, uh, every coin. But let's look at air pollution in the context of uh, the global economy, if you will. Uh, the Industrial Revolution, obviously, is where these things really started. Uh, and in fact, if we look at the early Industrial Revolution in terms of global economic growth output per person per year, uh, there's been a, certainly a major benefit to uh, what ultimately came out as air pollution in the end. Uh, and we've made great efforts to try to curb the, the downside of, of the global economy and the racing of the, ahead of uh, uh, sort of the marketing perspective, uh, if you will. Uh, and in fact, the, the Western uh, cultures, the Western nations have made great efforts to keep productivity up and reduce uh, air pollution. And in some of the developing nations now, they're going through more a rapid version of what we went through over the course of uh, many decades. Just to touch on a couple of things which you've, you're probably well aware of, some of the classic air pollution disasters. The first was the, the, the uh, Meuse River Valley in, in Belgium. In fact, that's where my mother actually grew up and I went to medical school there for a year a long time ago. Uh, but, uh, but the classic ones in the United States, uh, uh, one in the United States was Denora, Pennsylvania, uh, where 20 people died, 7,000 people were affected. Uh, and in fact, uh, there have been books written by this uh, uh, when Smoke Ran Like Water, Deborah Davis's book. It's a great book if you'd like to read it. And in fact, uh, um, there are folks who can recall, and this and there's actually a movie video, if you ever go on YouTube, that you can pick up of, of the, actually the smoke flowing across the, the community. The London Smog, of course, is the classic event uh, where some 4,000 people died. Uh, and interestingly enough, um, they were one of the first signs of the air pollution event itself were people getting run over on the street because they couldn't be seen by people driving. Uh, so there was a yeah, tick up of, of uh, mortality and morbidity associated with automobiles. And the newspapers of the time actually didn't report about this being an unhealthful condition for people. There was a state fair kind of activity going on outside London uh, where, in fact, uh, some of the prize animals were dying or sick. And that's what the newspapers were talking about. It wasn't until a couple of weeks afterwards that there was a lot of interest in, in the public health aspect. So over time, there's been a lot of go a lot going on trying to curb smoke. 
uh, in the U.S., uh, and I'm not going to go through all this, you can see a, a number of different legislative activities and ordinances in towns to try to clean up uh, what was considered more of a nuisance than, in fact, a, an air pollution problem. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't the 60s that sort of was the only event that really changed things. It, this was a slow accumulation over time of people uh, realizing that this was really kind of a problem and it was disturbing to their, their basic lifestyle. And I can remember myself as a child in the 50s, Sunday morning, a little black and white TV, and my parents would sleep in a little bit, and I'd get up and watch this television show that was called Industry on Parade, where they had these gears turning, smoke building out of stacks. It was an index of prosperity. And after the war, commercialization, productivity, etc., was a major, major, uh, it was of major importance. In fact, Eisenhower's highway system sort of brought a new dimension to this, this prosperity that really kind of fused and interconnected almost like in a capillary network the entire country with its industrial complex. As a result, there were a number of things that happened uh, in the U.S., much like uh, uh, you know, the London and the North situation. New York City had smogs that went into the, 60, into the 1960s where there was lots of uh, uh, sort of reducing kind of air pollution, as it was once called, mostly driven by sulfate and particles. And then the new air pollution, the, the, what we now call smog, which is an oxidant-based air pollution environment, which has lots of ozone and NOx and PAN and a number of other chemicals. And one of the first implications of the Clean Air Act and its enforcement capability was in 1972, just two years after the law was signed, uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, the coke ovens were generating so much smoke and people were so sick, they actually shut down the mills under federal authority. And the headline the newspaper was, do we want bread or breath? So you can see the choices people have to make, this whole concept of prosperity versus health. Uh, and what does it mean? So in the 60s, what was going on was that there was a a slow growth, mostly in urban communities where people were sort of making a, an effort to try to change things, uh, make things better. Uh, there were a few state programs, mostly municipal programs. Uh, they dealt with the opacity of smoke. They hold up this, this sheet or a piece of cardboard with different colors of gray and compare it to the sky or the smokestack to see how clean it was. Uh, and in fact, one of the first things that happened in terms of trying to control this is if you burn things hotter, you make particles smaller. If you make them small enough, and they're smaller than the wavelength of light, guess what? You don't see them. So one of the first approaches to dealing with some of this air pollution was to just burn things hotter and, and make them smaller, and you don't see it. How bad could it be? So it wasn't until like the early, the mid-60s or so that there began to be this coalition between the federal government and states to try to pull this together. The Air Pollution Control Association which eventually evolved into what was the, sort of the seed of the Environmental Protection Agency. There was a little bit of research going on, mostly out of the public health uh, service. Uh, there was a, a loose network of monitoring systems, <clears throat> but it was very, very, very crude. Uh, and uh, you can see how many employees were involved. Uh, 251 employees were actually involved in this entire uh, program. <clears throat> and there was some reduction in PM. Yeah, as people were shifting a little bit away from, uh, from residential coal use uh, and getting oil furnaces. So there was some uh, slow migration, if you will, towards the try to clean the air. And with Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which is mostly driven by pesticides uh, and other air pollution, there was just a general change in sentiment uh, that kind of led to the passage in 1965, uh, or 1963, rather, of the first Clean Air Act, as it was called. But it was very, very weak. Uh, gave a few grants to states. Uh, talked about car emissions a little bit. It was mostly hand waving. Uh, it wasn't much happening at all. Uh, and it wasn't until 1967 that there were some criteria actually established. Uh, but again, they were very weak, and there was no sort of coalition among the states. And then, with Earth Day in 1970, uh, uh, you see all around the country, 
driven not just by air pollution, but by all of the environmental issues. The burning Cuyahoga River, uh, uh, the Lake Year, I guess it was, that was on fire. Uh, there was a lot of environmental uh, movements. Uh, although I must say that these people being my compatriots of the, of the 60s, there are probably a number of them now that are CEOs of major international corporations. But uh, uh, not that that's necessarily bad, but uh, uh, it's interesting what, what, what happens to people over time. But this was a major event in 1970. Uh, and in fact, what happened was the creation of the Clean Air Act. And this is what's somewhat unbelievable. Uh, you had this 1967 Clean Air Act, which was essentially ineffective, considered to be dead. It was underfunded, understaffed, complicated, uh, really was not doing anything. Politics, just as today, was active back then. And Senator Edmund Muskie of Maine, who was going to be running for president, uh, was pushing a bill in Congress to create a Clean Air Act kind of thing. Um, uh, all the politicians were running around with the Earth Day and this sort of thing, trying to be green. It's not exactly what happens today, but that's what was happening in 1970. Uh, Richard Nixon, and most people think of Richard Nixon as Watergate, Tricky Dick, and all of those stories that we, we've heard over time, in fact, was going to be, felt he was going to be running against Edmund Muskie and said, I need to do something that's dramatic. So he pushed his Republican colleagues in a Republican Congress to actually come up with a Clean Air Act or a deep Clean Air Act amendment, which was stronger than that was being developed by the Democrats. And lo and behold, they passed it in two weeks in December. And he signed it right at the end of December. I think it was December 31st, uh, 1970. And, uh, well, actually, what am I saying here? 1970, January 31st, 1971. So it was right after. It's still called. It was passed in 1970. So lo and behold, that entire legislation was established in less than a month's time. What is incredible is that the documents, the what, what are now called integrated science assessments or criteria documents, what they used to be called, these at the time the entire PM one was this thick about this big around, this peak, it had everything in there. Now it's 2,800 pages. Um, and all, well, you'll see in a moment here, all of these air pollutants, photochemical oxidants, particulate matter, nitric oxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, which no longer exists as a criteria pollutant, and lead, all of these criteria documents and the NACs were all established by May of 1971. Now, we don't even get to make the five year. This was supposedly something that was going to be renewed every five years. And it, it never happens because there's constant reviews and lawsuits and reviews, etc. So in any case, a couple of uh, foundations of this is that cost would not be a factor in, in establishing the actual you know, uh, level of the, uh, the, clean, of the uh, pollutant. It would be health-based research. It would be health-based science that would make this decision. Cost could be put in, put in there afterwards to see what the implications would be after the decision was made, but not before the decision. So what kind of data actually fed into uh, support the Clean Air Act amendments? Well, as I mentioned before, there's certainly epidemiology, uh, animal toxicology, and in vitro studies and mechanisms to try to tie these things together. Uh, and trying to draw extrapolations ac across the various databases that we have. And this is still very much the case. Uh, epidemiology now is, uh, has become a very strong influence because of some of the new statistical methods that are being applied and new exposure metrics that can be applied to the epidemiology itself because it's on humans, on human populations, uh, and certainly allows people to come up with what, is, what are considered to be the, quote, most relevant kinds of uh, standards. So when they look at the pyramid of health effects associated with the NAX, I mean, there's a whole population at risk. And obviously, mortality is what you want to avoid. When you do it, the subsequent economic analysis of this, death is always the most expensive outcome. It, it's not really the case necessarily, but that is how it's computed through the Office of Management and Budget and other indices that are used to 
assess the effectiveness of the act. So as it turns out, just sort of jumping ahead to today, the PM standard in the United States, although it's a very expensive standard, is more cost effective, saves more money in terms of its impact than all other standards, Department of Health, Department of Transportation, any standard whatsoever in the federal government is dwarfed by the PM standard alone. Uh, and largely, that's because death is used as one of the major indices in evaluating the standard. And in fact, it's not often that death for health scientists is in other than infectious disease, for example, in that kind of health, uh, public health science. From an environmental perspective, you have something that's so dramatic that to actually, in fact, that you can count is what the epidemiology brought. So in this process, what we have is a whole series of documents. Now, you can see here, here's the draft. is a, a thousand page of the integrated plan. I told you the original one was about 150 pages. Uh, and it and of annexes of 2,300 pages. So these things are tomes at this particular point. And they go through a series of policy drafts, et cetera. Uh, they go through this process. You know, they start out with a workshop. They talk about what's, in, what's needed to develop this process. Uh, we developed the integrated science assessment. Uh, Case Act meets and reviews. This is the Clean Air Science Advisory Committee, which is a committee that uh, was established by uh, the administrator to do these, in part, to do these reviews. There's a risk exposure uh, aspect that's looked at. And this is sort of getting on the policy side, where the implications of, of this legislation in terms of improving health. And then that goes through a whole series of reviews before uh, ultimately a standard is promulgated, like the PM standard was just decided December 14th this past year. Uh, and in fact, this is supposed to take five years. It usually takes closer to 10, as it turns out. But this is where the health science gets plugged in. And all of these pollutants are being evaluated all the time. This always reminds me of an old World War II movie where they have little battleships on the table and they're moving around. Uh, but you can see where we are in time right here. We just had a PM standard, but you can see this is an arduous, difficult, and very expensive process, but one that has lots of implications at the end in terms of health. So where can we see the changes? Well, this I'm originally from the Boston area. This is an older picture of Boston and a cleaner picture of Boston. And this isn't just burning pollutants to make the the, uh, the particles smaller. This is actually there's actually evidence that the air is cleaner. And in fact, if you look over time, this is from 1970. Look at the uh, pollutant levels. Uh, you know, here population has grown substantially, almost 200 uh, percent. Miles driven, gross gross domestic product is up there. Uh, you can see that all the pollutant levels have decreased. Here is PM, for example, which is one that we spend a lot of time thinking about now, is down some 80 some percent. Uh, the other pollutants are down. Ozone, not quite as much because it's a secondary pollutant that comes from uh, secondary chemical reactions in the atmosphere. Uh, but here's sort of where we're headed to. If you look at energy use, population growth, CO2 production, they all go hand in hand. This is where our next challenge is is how are we going to deal with this? Because not only does it have implications here, this has implications back, and it has climate has implications, as I'll show you in a few minutes, on atmospheric uh, contaminants such as PM and ozone. And there are many people still, this is 2006, but it hasn't changed that much because the standards have actually gone down so the population shifts. If you look at all the max, the National Ambient Air Quality standards for all the pollutants, PM, ozone, NOx, lead, uh, carbon monoxide together, uh, there are some hundred million, it's a third of the U.S. population, is, are living in areas that are deemed uh, outside of compliance. And I, I want to avoid using the word safe, because oftentimes they say this is the standard, this must be some sort of safety index. It's a, st a statistical index. It, below that concentration, you cannot statistically measure a difference by going to a lower level. Hence, that's the best that they can do in terms of the standard. It's not considered, if you're a tenth of a ppm above it, you're, you're unsafe, and you're a tenth of a ppm below it, that you're, uh, that you're safe. It's, not, it's strictly a statistical assessment 
even though the press oftentimes talk about it as safety standard. They're not safety standard. So the Clean Air Act remains relevant because the issues that, that created the Clean Air Act are still pretty much in place. Uh, our political leaders, however, have not always been of the same mind uh, throughout this process. I mentioned Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon, shall we surrender our surroundings? I don't know if I can read it there, it's too bright. Our surroundings, or shall we make peace with nature and begin to make reparations for the damage we have done to our air, land, and water? That's the State of the Union in 1970, in the heat of all of this environmental movement. And Ronald Reagan, you know, a decade or so later, he comes up and says, air pollution, you know, we've gone overboard on this. You know, it's really volcanoes and trees. Uh, and and you know, there's, a, there's a little bit of if you, biogenics and trees, that's true, but you know, there's new evidence that shows that the, the pollutants that are caused by emissions, photochemical emissions associated with trees are driven by the anthropogenic precursors that actually drive those particular pollutants. But nevertheless, a uh, very popular president had a few things to say about the environment. And then we have Dan Quayle, under the first bush, talk about it's not pollution that's harming the environment, the impurities in the air and water that are doing it. He was always uh, one for getting some interesting quotes. And also, another one who actually comes up with interesting quotes, he doesn't talk about emissions, he talks about admissions uh, into the air. Uh, so it's always interesting, you know, our political leaders always bring a certain amount of humor to uh, the assessment of environmental uh, uh, situations. And our current president of the United States talks about investing in biomedical research, information technology, and especially clean energy technology, focusing primarily in these comments at this particular time on clean coal, which among scientists is an arguable endpoint if we can ever get there. Uh, this obviously is changing with uh, hydrofracking and, and and gas, etc. But moving in a different direction, hopefully realizing that energy and technology is one of the major factors associated with our, our air pollution problem. And more recently, through the recent political environment, here I think most people re remember uh, when they abandoned the decision on the ozone standard and they delayed the PM standard for a while. There were a lot of people on the left who were commenting that, what's happened? He was one of us. Now he's shifting away from, from air pollution. But then, in 2011, as the politics starts to change, uh, he goes from abandoning stricter air quality rules, at least perceived by the press at that time, to coming up with an agenda that has a sweeping attack on air pollution. And in fact, if you look at the inauguration, the uh, uh, State of the Union message, we talked about climate and the emphasis placed on climate. Anything that we do to the advantage of climate change uh, is going to have a benefit on air pollution because it's largely combustion driven. So a couple of highlights that have shaped the current air health agenda from uh, as we're moving ahead. You know, it, it, I, I was talking about uh, the 1970s and the improvement in air pollution, that sort of thing. There was a lot of emphasis on sulfur and coal in the 70s and 80s. We get rid of the sulfur. We know sulf sulfuric acid, it's acidic. It's got to be bad for you. Um, it's killing the trees. It's acidifying the lakes. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis. You couldn't see across the Grand Canyon because of sulfuric acid smog. Um, in fact, there were papers published by David Bates where in one paper he would talk about ozone being the culprit in the smog over Montreal, and then he would write another paper on the sulfuric acid and that same smog being the culprit. So it was, it was great, great fun back in those days. But there was a lot of emphasis placed on, on sulfuric acid and sulfur technology. There was a big push to lower sulfur emissions. And with that was a a, a, a decrease in particles, because sulfate is still a major, at that time was a major component of, of, uh, of uh, particulate matter, particularly on the East Coast. But it was found that acid aerosols really didn't have much health effects that they, you could measure directly. And this gets away, I'll get back to this afterwards, because 
you know, the single, remember the max are individual pollutants. And we know that we're not exposed to individual pollutants. We can come up with standards for individual pollutants, which may not always be as beneficial as we might otherwise think. But certainly, sulfuric acid seem like a baddie, but in fact, they expose people to many milligrams per cubic meter of sulfuric acid. And if you're an asthmatic, you have a little bit of wheezing, and that's about it. <clears throat> but what happened was, is that by reducing sulfur, you can see this is a color, colorized version of the eastern part of the U.S. with most of the industry here in the central part, uh, blowing east. Uh, but there was lots in, in the 80s of, of acidified uh, aerosol, which is greatly reduced over, the, over time. And interestingly, interestingly enough, the Republican Congress that pushed this reduction used a cap-and-trade approach to reducing sulfur, which the current Congress says they will never use for controlling carbon, which could be very much a similar kind of benefit. But nevertheless, that's the way the, uh, the cookie crumbles sometimes. But because there was no health effect and we reduced the PM, we were reducing the sulfur, the, the general consensus was the PM problem was solved. You don't have to worry. The standard epidemiology couldn't measure any particular health effect unless you were in a really, really dirty environment. So that problem was solved, and everyone paid attention to ozone after that. You know, ozone was the modern new dimension of air pollution. You know, you can measure health effects from ozone at levels that we're exposed to. Or not, maybe not so much in, in Vancouver, but certainly in, in the southwest of the U.S. and the New York area and Atlanta. Uh, and you can see decreases in lung function associated with air pollution. You can measure the effects in animals. There are, uh, there's evidence of chronic health effects at relatively low levels. Asthmatics seem to be particularly sensitive. So there's a lot of attention paid to ozone. And the ozone standard slowly went down over time. Uh, and there have been improvements. It's a difficult pollutant to get a handle on. But in the midst of this, some crafty epidemiologists came up with new statistical methods to show or to suggest that as many as 50, 60,000 people a year were dying from PM levels at the current standard in the early 90s. Uh, Joel Schwartz, Doug Dockery, and a few other folks were, were working on these, on these studies. And they showed, taking a study which was originally designed to look at sulfur, the Six City study out of Harvard, which uh, Mike, you probably had worked in a little bit too, looked at Portage, Wisconsin, and a whole bunch of cities of different degrees of air pollution, Steubenville, Ohio, which is the smoking room in the background here. Uh, when we look at total particles in the air and looked at mortality, starting with one being no difference, Portage is pretty clean, Topeka pretty clean, Steubenville, there's evidence that people were dying from PM. Tighten up the size of the smaller particles of what you're looking at. Those particles that get deeper in the lung, and it tightened up this relationship. So size appeared to be an important factor in air pollution. In the early days, you caught particular matter with a bucket, basically. Total suspended particulates that fly wings and everything else in there. Then they went to a PM10 standard in the late 70s because PM10 actually made it through your nose for the most part. So that's how they established that standard. But now they were moving towards even smaller particles. If you looked at susceptibility, People with pre-existing cardiopulmonary disease, COPD, or heart disease seem to be more sensitive, which tended to encompass most older people who have those diseases. So there's a movement towards, there's something else going on here. In the same six city studies, there was a decrease in longevity. Decrease in, in if you lived for 15 years in Steubenville, your life expectancy decreased by around two years, on average, compared to Portage, Wisconsin which is like a pack of cigarettes a day. So there's a lot of evidence to push in a compelling way the development of a PM 2.5 standard, which was established in 1997. So there's a lot. What's causing this? We're at a level of PM, which you can't really see much in the air. It's hard to believe. How can this possibly be killing people? This whole issue of biologic plausibility. So the gauntlet was thrown to toxicologists and people doing health studies in, in human subjects come up with a reason to make me believe this statistical anomaly, because I don't believe it. Much, much controversy, much, much going on. So there's a lot of focus looking at healthy lungs versus inflammatory lungs. 
This is from the ozone studies. He saw many of the same. These technologies were developed under looking at ozone, but now they're looking at PM, looking at effects associated with PM, mostly focusing on the lung. Uh, but lo and behold, all around the same time, there was a realization of what a lot of physiologists have been saying for a long time, that the, all the blood that comes out of the, of the heart goes through the lungs, all the air, all the blood that comes out of the lungs goes back through the heart. The circulatory system pump and the lung pump are interconnected hydraulically, they're interconnected anatomically, they're interconnected neurologically. So if you have a disease of the lungs, it's probably going to affect your heart. If you have a disease of the heart, it's probably going to affect your lungs. Why are we thinking of air pollution only affecting the lungs? So the science slowly moved. Epidemiology was suggesting that this was going on. There was some old toxicology that suggested this was going on. In fact, so old that you go back to the London smog. <clears throat> uh, here's the mortality associated with particles. And you can't really see the color on, at least as, as it's projected here. There's a blip associated with cardiovascular disease also. Well, it doesn't seem to be as big as respiratory, but there are a whole lot more people with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. Probably of us in this room, 30 to 40 percent of us will ultimately die from cardiovascular disease, not from respiratory disease. So because you're in that, except for a couple of people who are out and run every day, uh, this is Vancouver, so I forget it. Um, so in fact, there's a bigger population at risk when we look at this. And strangely enough, uh, my advisor, Maria Ember, who was at Harvard at, at the time, and, and sort of a crusty old lady, uh, she trained under Cecil Drinker, uh, who invented the iron lung. Those of you who remember the polio story, she was chased around by thugs from the smelting industry when she first started to do work with sulfuric acid and sulfur dioxide in the early 50s. And when I was writing her biography for a journal after she, uh, she passed away, I found in one of her notebooks in a study in 1952 with sulfuric acid and SO2, which she had written in the side margin interesting ECG changes, we should get back to this. They used to put ECG reads on the subjects back then. The human ethics officials back then didn't, weren't quite like they are today. You put ECG reads on folks to make sure they live through your experiment. You know, you, as long as you can see their heart beating, everything was okay. So, we never, we never get back to this. In 19... I think that we'll be down here. I think it's 1976. This toxicology study was published, looking at this whole host of susceptible rats. Uh, and I'll just jump ahead here. And this is only like three out of about ten different susceptible models looked at. But animals that were susceptible to thrombogenic red clot formation, hypertensive rats, anemic rats, exposed to a mix of air pollutants. Here, multi pollutant stuff was being done back then. This is in the 70s now. Uh, relatively high concentrations, but not as high as you might, might think. Uh, and they're low, medium, high. And look at the mortality here. It says you remember rats, 1 out of 20 at high level. Thrombogenic rats, 6 out of 10. Hypertensive rats, 11 out of 11. This is the exposure, I think, that was a couple months, maybe six months. I forget what it was. Munich rats, uh, they didn't see any any health effect here. So clearly there was a cardiovascular component going on. And they couldn't publish this in the health journal. I had to publish it in the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. It was the only group of reviewers that would let it go through. It was a descriptive, fairly crude study, but you know how uh, foretelling was this? So things have been going on, and oftentimes these things happen. They're right under our noses, and we don't realize that. So in fact, there have been a number of studies. I'm not going to go through them all. This is a study out of Harvard uh, looking at associations between MIs and where they, people could have an MI, and they can go back and look 24 hours beforehand what they were exposed to. And you can see a relationship here. Days before onset, odds ratio for a heart attack in these individuals associated with PM. There have been studies that have been done in human subjects exposing them to uh, 
uh, amb concentrated ambient particles, and you can see a decrease in heart rate variability. That's an index that's used sometimes for looking at risk to subsequent heart uh, outcomes. And a study that I was pleased to be involved in with Penn Watkinson at, at EPA, and this is in the mid-90s. We could telemeter rats and expose them to, this was a residual oil fly ash, which is some oil uh, burning, has a lot of metals. And we did an ECG tra uh, trade here. These animals uh, were uh, not just hypertensive, they were actually pulmonary hypertensive. So that they also had a lot of pulmonary inflammation. And over the course of just a few hours after exposure, their hearts went into an arrhythmic event. And anyone who watches uh, Meredith Grey or one of those TV shows knows that that's not a good sign when things go flat. So we're actually able to measure in animals some of the outcomes that we could predict potentially with these other studies. And in fact, we tried to submit a couple of these papers to the American Heart Association for presentation at the national meeting, and they would reject them right out. The cardiologists had no interest. Cardiologists are interested in the heart. The lungs just provide air. Pulmonologists just look at the lungs. The heart's there and pump blood through so that the air has some place to go. Slowly but surely, the American Heart Association adopted the whole concept that air pollution had a health effect. And in their second treatise, their second statement on particulate matter and cardiovascular disease, their conclusion was that the overall evidence is consistent with a causal relationship between PM2.5 exposure and cardiovascular mortal mortality and morbidity. So how does this happen? Well, we know a little bit more, but not the whole story. We have a heart here. Oftentimes, elderly people have pre-existing heart disease. Uh, so they're somewhat impaired. You breathe particles. Some of the particles may, in fact, uh, go directly into the lung. There's some talk about that with some of the ultrasounds. Or it could be things that dissolve off of the, uh, uh, the particles. On one side, you have a whole series of pulmonary reflexes involving the autonomic nervous system that cause heart rate variability changes and cause a number of things to lead to uh, cardiac dysfunction. And this is an area of my own research right now that we're spending a fair amount of time looking at. There's also pulmonary inflammation, which was the first thing we were looking at, but that kind of sets the stage for secondary things, systemic inflammation, uh, which has clotting aspects associated with it, endothelial dysfunctions. There's a whole host of things going on, which on a chronic basis may in fact lead to atherosclerosis. There's some human evidence for that, and we can in fact uh, show that that can lead to an event that leads to a uh, significant cardiac event. So what lies ahead? So there are a number of issues that still reside. A uh, recent paper sh suggests that 5% of all mortality in the U.S. is associated with air pollution, taking the models and the statistical approaches. There are a high number of uh, hospitalizations, particularly among children with pre-existing disease, and that's for PM that differs on the East Coast, versus the West Coast versus the East Coast. So it's more than, there's some, there's some, why can't things follow their constituent elements? That's still an issue that resides there. We now have to look at a multi-pollutant reality. We've always been looking at single pollutants at a time, where in fact, if you look at the black areas on this map, you'll see that most of the time when you have bad air pollution for one pollutant, you have bad air pollution with others. So climate change is coming in, has all sorts of implications. Water, air, food, shelter, and all of these interact with one another. There is a socioeconomic component to air pollution, which climate is forcing us to look at. And in fact, there's th these colors on this uh, slide here are simply the difference in 2050, given the flat emissions between now and 2050, of what's going to happen because of climate, and this will be ozone, increases. So there's an ozone penalty associated with climate change, more efficient conversion of the precursors into the outcomes of, of ozone. And in fact, as we heard a little bit this morning, cook stones and ambient black carbon are a problem that intransigent would be a, a subtle way of saying that we're far away from being able to solve this. And this is not just a technological issue. This is another socio-economic socio, uh, uh, issue to be concerned with. 
So we listed Jackson question mark because she's no longer the administrator. We don't know who the new woman's going to be. But she came out and said that this issue of energy and climate, two sides of the same coin. So if you look, in fact, population is growing. We have a billion people in 1804. They're predicting now, seven, well, we have 7 billion now, 10 to 15 billion in the year, uh, this, I think, yeah, 3,000. So population growth. What does that mean? We have poorer people, we have richer people. Well, in fact, if you break, the, this is from the uh, World Bank, if you break things down to a population growth in terms of um, uh, the, the demand on energy, what are our requirements? If all things being equal, there's not that much difference, really, uh, between the poor environment, the, the poor populations, and the richer environments. If everything is sort of increasing at the same speed. So we created a bigger population. We have more energy demand. Surprise, surprise. Well, in fact, if we shift economic growth primarily to the poorer people, which is sort of what we're sort of, we think things are going, there's going to be greater energy demand for poorer people. But in fact, under our current trends, where most economic growth is in the richer environments, with everyone having three cell phones, everyone having full-time TVs that they're always on even when they're turned off, our energy demands may be even bigger in the more developed countries. So in fact, we, more so than the, the, the lesser developed countries that are growing, that we keep complaining about, are probably where the problem lies. So just take the population impact, for example, David Douglas of Sun Microsystems that used to exist but was bought out. He said in 15 years, the global population will increase by a billion. Give each one of those people a 60 watt light bulb to hold. Turn it on, this is how much it weighs, about 15,000 Prius, 15, Priuses worth of, uh, of light bulbs. Turn it on at 60,000 kilo, uh, 60, kilowatts. Use it four hours a day. So that's the new population holding a light bulb that's turned on for four hours a day. The power needed to generate those light bulbs, just those light bulbs, is about 2,500 megawatt coal-fired power plants. Just for population growth. Not for economic growth, not for technology growth. So that's where the problem lies. And that's just to turn those lights on for four hours a day. So how are we going to do this? Well. This is the U.S. Looking, looking from space. You can see areas of, uh, of high light, certainly in the big city areas. But if you look, focus here in Williston, North Dakota, which had a population of around 2,000 people about 10 years ago. That population now has gone up by about a factor of eight. And in fact, it's being driven right here, this body of light which is 24 hours a day of hydrofracking to drive energy. This has implications. It can be done safely. It probably can be done poorly, which in some cases it is, and which is why there's so much controversy right now. But this is where some of the energy challenges uh, lay for the future. So this is one that you can't see all that well, but if you were sitting on Mars, you'd see that we're not a whole lot different from anywhere else. We're just a little speck in the sky. And how are we going to deal with that? Well, here are my projections to the future if I have a couple of minutes to finish, or do I need to terminate right now? Two minutes. I can get through this in two minutes. And it won't be that fast. One of the things that I think we need to think about are solutions. Our thinking, particularly on the health side, oftentimes is, especially among toxicologists, this is toxic, this is toxic, this is bad, this is bad. Well, that's useful to an extent. But it's really, how do we turn this into something that is a solution orientation? How does that help guide us and inform us to make the right decisions? So we can put it in a systems context, which perhaps will help us sort these differences and bring them together. What about sustainability? Some people think, you know, we're just on a slow decline. How steep is that slope going to be? It's not a question of whether, it's a question of how, of when. Can we slow things down? Can we do it by taking systems approaches, solutions approaches, so that eventually we can reach some balance in the sustainability question before all our resources are consumed? There are human factors. 
susceptibility issues, epigenetic issues, of course, but also just general health issues. People are getting fatter. People are not as healthy as they used to be. That's changing the environment we're working with. And there are also social issues that play into this. What makes people make decisions in spite of all the information that they have to make a good decision? And of course, climate change. Are we ready to deal with this? So from a toxicologist's perspective, what I encourage my students to do is to think out of the box. That's easily said, but it's sometimes very difficult to do. We're looking, trying to use high throughput methods to try to look at pathways of so-called 21st century toxicology, and that's useful, but it's just one element of things that we're looking at. We need to look at appropriate animal models. Not everything that can be done in the healthy rat that we've bred to be genetically pure and lives in an environment better than the hotel that I'm staying in. Well, I have to gone up to see my rat. There's something that we need to change. This issue of susceptibility, frailty, epigenetic, genetic issues, and the whole issue of homeostasis. Our bodies want to survive. We want to live. Is it that shift of homeostasis? Is an elderly person just closer to the edge of the table because of his or her disease so that one little push that to any of us is just a minor perturbation in our day pushes them off the table? Is that where our frailty exists? And looking at realistic scenarios, not the single pollutant, not the, you know, the monotonic shape of, of the exposure environment. And we always look at the effect of the air pollutant. What about what an air pollution exposure today does to how you behave tomorrow or how you respond tomorrow? Uncle Harry's cigar, once you've been primed by air pollution, may be a whole lot worse than had you not had that air pollution beforehand. And there's evidence to that. What about epidemiologists? Yeah, I'm getting on thin ice here, so I'll go through quickly. Moving towards causality. If the kid is here of epidemiology, but we are making strides, and we need to continue to make strides towards causality. Enhanced statistical designs so to look at multi pollutant models, both in time and space. Public health tracking with climate change. Everything is going to be changing, so looking at what happened 20 years ago is not necessarily going to help us. We need to look concurrently in real time. The issue of susceptibility, both short and long term aspects of susceptibility. What makes you susceptible now? What will make you susceptible after a lifetime of exposure? And the whole issue of using social media to help fuel this, this process. Everything is changing. Air quality and a changing landscape. And of course, how do we know we're better off when we have heavier people, non-exercising people? And lastly, the global context of genes in the environment, the whole nature to nurture approach. So with that, thank you. I'm sorry if I went a little bit late because we get long-winded. Uh, but in fact, the sun will continue to rise and we need to be prepared for it. Thank you. I'm thinking I should let the, uh, the online people always get poor treatment. So do you have any questions yet from online? Okay, no. Nothing. OK, if you guys online, if you have questions, bring them. Uh, how about the? Real life crowd here. See, I always ask a lot of questions, but since no one else is, I'll, I'll continue that. Um, oh, good. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you will. <laughs> uh, just a great presentation. Just following up on your last few slides, um, do you feel that um, we need to continue researching? the uh, detrimental health effects of exposure to, um, to air pollution? Or ha has there been enough research to suggest that, OK, it's bad for us, it's causing us a series of health problems, that maybe our focus, research focus, and, and policy focus should be then almost universally on um, solutions and uh, more or less what we can do to fix the problem? I think we still need that kind of research. I think it needs to progress in an, in, in an, in an informed context. And, and what I mean by that is, where does this fit in? So for example, there's a lot of evidence now, in fact, we talked about this morning, of some of these potential neurologic aspects 
associated with air pollution. Well, that's probably not so much a real short-term event, but it's a longer-term event. How is that? How are we going to prepare for that unless we know something about that? But how does that relate to the acute effects? Are there acute predictors of those long-term outcomes? And if there are, can we use them now to move in the direction of trying to make decisions? Oftentimes, and you know, scientists oftentimes want all the information they can possibly get before they can they feel a decision can be made because you're never really 100% certain. Well, guess what, folks? Well, things are moving so fast, we don't have time necessarily. So what's the cost benefit of making a decision now, knowing that sometimes you're not going to be wrong, but maybe you can make a mid-course correction without having to turn over the apple cart to do it. And in the current political environment that we have, that's very difficult to do because people want certainty. Okay, um, what I was going to ask you, Dan, is, uh, as you know, I'm American, and I'm struck in Canada by, well, the blessings we have with the, with the cleaner, on average, I suppose, here. Um, what do you say to a country where we haven't really needed, as far as I see it, the same kinds of regulations that the U.S. has? I mean, the U.S. has been a, a forerunner and a model in a lot of ways, along with Europe. Canada hasn't necessarily needed quite the same because of the relatively lower standards. What does history tell us in your perspective that a, a country that's in that sort of fortunate position should, should do proactively? Well, I think it gets back to some of the sustainability issue. Uh, you have the advantage that sustainability may in fact be the light, a light at the end of the tunnel as opposed to darkness at the end of the tunnel. Um, I think you can take advantages of the trials and tribulations of other, like of the United States, and going through this process. Uh, some countries that are trying to move very, very fast economically, you know, it's damn with torpedoes, full speed ahead kind of thing, and, and they're going through the same thing at a warp speed that took us a half a, that a half a century to do. They're doing it in ten years, like China, for example. But they're, they're suddenly real. They're also the, the the primary producer of wind energy, but also the primary producer of solar energy. So, you know, th there's a paradox there that's almost hard to fathom. So, but the thing is, is what Canada can do is certainly, you know, know what, where those sensitive tipping points are and try to protect those tipping points because you have that advantage. <laughs> So uh, thank you again, Dan. Sure. Thank you.